as well. Okay, so I just wanted to say that my task tonight is really, really simple. Because all I've got to do is introduce these great speakers. They'll say really provocative things, and you'll respond by asking questions. That's how it works. Okay. They've got, to, they've got to say provocative things, and you've got to ask questions, okay? Have I made it clear that you're going to ask some questions? No, say it again, no, Toby. I don't right. quite understand. It'd be really time. nice at the end if you ask some questions of these provocative speakers. Okay, so just to put some background on it, Shape got involved in this project because Bridget Telfer, who is here in the middle, suggested to me that they found some really interesting images that they didn't know very much about in their collection. And I'm not going to say too much about it because Bridget's going to say that. And she said that she thought Shape might be interested. And I thought, ooh, Royal College of Physicians, they're a bit posh and they're doctors. And we work to the medical model of disability and we have um, mixed views as disabled people about the medical profession. So is that a reason for not being involved? Or is that for a reason for really being involved and getting hold of it and getting into a dialogue and into an interesting discussion? And I'm so glad that we did, because I think we've had a fantastic partnership. And lots of interesting things have come out of this exhibition. And one of the things we talked about doing was getting some disabled people together to discuss and dialogue these images. And and that's why Sophie Partridge is here. And this is Sophie Partridge here. And she was a focus group participant, one of the 27 people who work in the culture of, well, the creative and cultural industries. And they're very opinionated, actually. And said <laughs> fantastic things about um, these images that they were, that they were um, looking at and talking to each other about. And some really rich dialogue and some really rich ideas came out of thrusting those 27 people together. And I've talked about Bridget Telfer, she's from the Royal College of Physicians, she create, curated this exhibition. And I've talked about Sophie as being part of the focus group. I've not talked about Professor John Howard, who's on the end, and he's the Professor of American Studies from King College London. And he's going to open the batting for us tonight. I was going to say one other thing, but I'm not sure I'm allowed to say it. So I'm just going to whisper in Bridget's ear. <laughs> I love you, Bridget. Marry me. <laughs> okay, I can say something about the fact that this exhibition has been nominated for a national award. Yeah, nominated. <laughs> And we'll tell you more about that when we can officially tell you. I think it's a bit of a secret, so <laughs> keep it to yourselves. But don't be surprised when you see that it's been nominated for a national award. And if we win, that would be great, won't it? Fantastic. We could have a party. Yeah, why not? Yes, we probably will have a party. Probably at the Royal College of Physicians. They do better canapes. <laughs> and they have slightly better vintage of wine than we do. And without further ado, let me introduce <coughs> Professor John Howard to talk to you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's a real honour to be here. I'm absolutely delighted. I'm extraordinarily impressed with the exhibition that's been on display here. And I'm delighted, as clearly everyone else is, that uh, it's getting the proper kind of recognition that it deserves. Um, the first provocative thing I'm going to say, you've set a, set a high bar for us, Tony. The first provocative thing I'm going to say is, is that the remote? <laughs> right. I the remote is an idea. <laughs> Great. Well, um, it's especially nice for me to be here because I'm meeting new friends and uh, lots of old ones, um, former students of mine at King's College London. Um, and sadly, um, they're going to hear um, the same kinds of ideas <laughs> I've been banging on about for years. <laughs> But um, Kirsty was very nice to invite me to say just a few words um, as a sort of context for tonight's discussion around categories of difference, essentially the way in which we human beings imagine ourselves as either similar or quite different from one another. It's, it's, it's that basic, really. And I just wanted to start first with um, kind of three historical moments, three historical movements, really, um, and they are 
first, that moment right after the Second World War, that, you know, remembering the horror of the Holocaust, remembering the kind of unprecedented level of the targeting and killing of civilian populations of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and this new promise that we all thought might happen around a kind of post-war humanism and universalism. This, uh, this idea, this moment stressed the sameness of all human beings. We really are all alike, we are one. We must make sure together that this atrocity, these kinds of atrocities, never happen again. Then we began to move into a moment, 50s, 60s, 70s, where there was just one after another, these incredible series of movements for social change, and the rise of a very particular kind of politics, often grassroots in nature, often very localized, that proceeded from an assumption that, an assumption about identity, you know, certain aspects of my character inform my politics, certain aspects of my being inform my politics, and that became known as identity politics, and it really stressed some of the fundamental differences between human beings. And then thirdly, an era that I would say we're still in now to some extent, I'd be curious to know what you think, this idea of multiculturalism and the way in which it is very much celebrated. So we hear a lot about the celebration of difference, and especially difference as the most fundamental sort of similarity that we share. But I'll, I'll say more about that shortly. But first, you'll, you'll know very, very well what post-war humanism and universalism was about. There was this sense that we needed a kind of international authority, and we needed all nations to get together in this new body called the United Nations. And we decided we'd even get you know, the world of finance sorted out through these big governing bodies in the International Monetary Fund. But of course, there was a problem right there from the early days. Nearly one quarter of the human population was not represented in many of these bodies, namely the People's Republic of China. But there was a great optimism in this period. And so there, the UN brought together a group of noted scientists who issued in 1948 a universal declaration of human rights. Sorry, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. There was a, a need, this, this desire to bring together scientists to speak about race was there right from the beginning. But more than that, and before that, in 1948, there was a sense that we had to actually make a statement, a kind of, a kind of constitution almost, a sort of world constitution, stating that we all, all human beings, and this is in the very first sentence, or part of the same human family. And I think that particular choice of metaphor is quite interesting. Uh, and then they proceeded to set out uh, a kind of bill of rights for all humans across the earth. That was followed very shortly thereafter in 1950 by the UNESCO Statement on Race, where scientists argued essentially that there is no fundamental scientific basis for the concept of race. Now that doesn't mean obviously that race as it's lived day to day in culture and society doesn't greatly advantage some people and greatly disadvantage others. It does, but as a kind of essence, as a kind of scientific reality, scientists began to say no, there's really nothing in that. And then there was this extraordinary phenomenon called the Family of Man exhibition. Does anyone know this? Yes? <laughs> a few of us from King's College London. The Family of Man exhibition, with no modesty, declared itself as the greatest photographic exhibition of all time. 503 pictures from 68 countries curated by Edward Steichen for the Museum of Modern Arts, right? So it's a New York-based institution. It is uh, an individual from Luxembourg relocated to the United States, quite famous photographer Edward Steichen, who's, who is indeed putting on the largest exhibition of all time because it tours to any number of countries, and quite literally millions of people see it. And it too is arguing this, this really optimistic post-war notion. 
We are all the same. We're all one. And he used a cycle of life theme. So, you know, the idea that all of us go through something similar at birth, we all grow up, we all date, there's a section on dancing, we all get married, it seems to assert. And here, in this incredible spread, um, you get the kind of mapping, mapping of, a, of a middle class American sensibility, you know, man and wife, uh, onto the entire earth. If you had looked at marriage rituals across varied countries in the 1950s, they'd be quite divergent, right? There was polygamy practiced in any number of places. There was even the early rumblings of same-sex marriage, right? But this is what Edward Steichen said marriage looks like. It is the same for everyone across the world. Well, obviously, there was, and, and you'll see that at the very end of the exhibition, you know, you have the little boy leaving the girl into the bright new future. So you're really getting this notion of kind of coupling, kind of heterosexual coupling as, as the way we all do it. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a universal, how similar we all are. Well, that led to arguments for change and arguments about difference, right? So then we saw in the 50s and increasingly in the 1960s these extraordinary movements for social change and the rise of identity politics. You'll know very well about a variety of black freedom struggles, African-American civil rights movement in the States, similar movements here in the UK, and in particular, uh, post-colonial struggles throughout much of the empire and former empires of various European powers. There was LGBT organizing, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer rights organizing from the earliest days of the 50s and 60s that many of us know about 1969's Stonewall Riots. Some think about that as the pivotal moment or the emblematic moment in queer organizing. Disability, disabilities rights movements were enjoying a new kind of visibility, a new sort of agency. And of course, then by the 80s, um, there was HIV AIDS Act. Some of it quite powerful, enabling um, stridents, uh, rightly so. But I want to show how many of these organizations owed some of their chief debts to second wave feminism, to ideas that were circulating among women in the late 60s and 70s. And I want to do that through just a handful of images. First, isn't it funny how some of the African American freedom struggles and, uh, and some of the movements and some of the slogans actually mirrored some of this kind of Edward Steichen language, right? I am a man. I belong to the family of man. And look how very um, interestingly they are positioned, these black men, insisting I am a man. They're positioned against these white men with their bayonets, and these bayonets literally cut right across their shadows in this image, right? A beautiful image, I think, by Charles Moore. Women in the, in the civil rights movement began to suggest that there, there are problems in these kinds of statements. Indeed, the, the famous jail no bail strategy. We'll just all go to jail. We'll just all participate in civil disobedience and we'll just fill the jails and that will overwhelm you administratively. Well, women had different risks in jail than men did. And one of our quite talented doctoral students at King's is looking at the ways in which women were subjected to sexualized violence as a quite explicit tool of white oppression in the American South, for example. This is an image taken very shortly after the Stonewall Riots in New York in 1969. And look how similar it is to this image. Oh, there we are. Look, how, look at the similarity. And further, look at the borrowing of language upper left. We shall overcome. This is a group of disability rights activists in 1973, around the time of the passage of the Rehabilitation Act. I love the angle. It's absolutely direct, right? People coming right towards you. Access is a right, right? And the image is shot kind of low, so, so you're looking up just a bit, so it kind of gives a, 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 a heroified sort of impression. <laughs> But most importantly, it's people acting, right? This is what disability rights activism 
seems to be about for me. And related, uh, as a part of disability rights, there is a strain of anti-nuclear activism that argues the rights of a particular group of people, indeed what I would argue is an unprecedented class of human beings. They are known as Hibakusha. They are individuals who have lived through the horrors of a nuclear bomb. Right, so in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, of course, tens of thousands are killed instantly. Tens of thousands are killed over the next day or two. But then there are many, many more who live on and suffer lifelong consequences of exposure to radiation. This is a new class of human being called Hibakusha in Japanese, but you'll also find them in southern Spain, where the United States accidentally dropped four hydrogen bombs in 1966. Did you know that? The U.S. military has done a pretty good job of keeping that under wraps. <laughs> I'm not crazy about Nicholas Nixon's images of people with HIV and AIDS from the late 80s. Many have bitterly complained that the individuals are just that, individualized, passive, suffering. There's not only no sense of agency, but there's no sense of the community around these individuals. I mean, look how this Nicholas Nixon portrait contrasts with this one by here, William Klein. Do you know this image? Have you seen this one before? Right, this, is, this is a group of angry people, and they're letting their concerns be known. And indeed, there's a picture within the picture, if you notice. Two fellows, interestingly, 1945, right after the war, just out of the Navy, are kissing. And ACT UP has reappropriated this image and in, a, in an explicit rebuke of George Herbert Walker Bush, who famously said in the States, well, we have new taxes, read my lips, absolutely not. Well, they're saying as they kiss him, read my lips. This is a new brand of quite in-your-face sort of activism. And, of course, there's the 1968 Miss America pageant where women said, we're tired of pantyhose and we're tired of eyeliner and we're tired of things that cost us a lot, that are made, meant to make us look beautiful to men, and yet, do we in fact really mean them, right? Rethinking some of the fundamental assumptions about gender, as well as sexuality in other categories. This is one of my favorite portraits. This is by a lesbian uh, photographer called Jeb Joan E. Byron. She finds a sign in a little town called Dyke, Virginia. <laughs> and she puts herself underneath it, and she does what, um, what we've seen with, with, with a lot of the best kinds of self-portraiture. She, she takes the picture of herself, and she reclaims what was often quite a nasty word, right? The reappropriation of language, we know, is a frequent part of movements uh, for equality. Now, quickly, and I'll move to a, to a close here. We are in a period that's, that I would call a period of multiculturalism and its celebrants. And I think, frankly, there's, there's kind of a problem with this moment. There is this sense that we honor diversity, right? And that's, that's got to be a good thing. We celebrate it. But there has also been a kind of political correctness backlash. We you know this phrase, it's used all the time in the newspaper, even to this day, and I think it's one of the most cynical, crafty uses of language I have ever heard, right? Basically, this kind of rhetorical masterstroke is used to call, so, so that those of us, say, who call for increased sensitivity, those of us who call for tolerance, who insist that particular groups and individuals should, should have the capacity for self-determination, and name themselves. Those kinds of calls, in an incredible reversal, are recast as intolerance, <laughs> right? The, urging people to be more sensitive and tolerant is recast as intolerance. The dracon we're accused of a kind of draconian policing of free speech or free thought. Why can't I just say whatever I want, no matter how racist, no matter how offensive it is? You're, you know, you're hurting my right to free speech. I, I distrust those kinds of assertions. 
are we really in a post-racial age? Do we really believe that race no longer matters in hiring decisions, for example? Are we in a post-feminist age? Do we really believe that women have achieved parity? Strangely, in this era of multiculturalism, there is a defense of difference as all that we have in common. It's a kind of connective tissue, the argument goes, right? That links us all together as individuals. Of course we're all different. We all have different fingerprints, you know, the myth of fingerprints. Everything about us all is different as individuals. But what this does, this kind of argument of difference is, is the fundamental similarity. What that does is the, erases the particularity of differences, right? And the distinctive sorts of discriminations that some of us are subjected to as a result of our difference. Now, the caricature, you know, those who call, scream against political correctness, the caricature of identity politics looks like this. It's an interest group politics. It's, it's kind of like the pro-gun lobby or the automotive lobby. Right? It's very self-serving self-interested. It argues special rights, not equal rights. You hear that one lot, right? It will result in undue minority influence. It's narrow, ignoring the common good. And really, these are, these are often really private concerns, less, less left out of the public sphere. Well, I want to argue that there's still a lot of good mileage in identity politics, and especially if we get back to some of the fundamental feminist roots of what could be a better identity politics. First and foremost, the personal is always political. This line between personal space and public space, it's very blurry, right? And certainly something as seemingly private and intimate as sexuality, for example, is something that we've been legislating about for centuries. It's utterly, utterly public. And what I especially like about this notion of the personal is political and what you see in the narratives on the walls that accompany many of the portraits, many of Lynn Weedle's portraits, is this sense that I must speak. I speak as someone who, who doesn't quite fit in with these big narratives of sameness, these big universal narratives. And speaking my own story will demonstrate that. So for example, I might, and this was very common from the 60s, I might say, I am white, I am male, and that gets me a lot of unearned privilege in this world. Right? That gets me, that opens doors for me, that lets me move in ways that many others don't. But I might also say, um, I'm left-handed, actually I'm right-handed, which 100 years ago was an amazing privilege. Because if you were left-handed 100 years ago, you could be severely, severely punished. I'm HIV positive. And I am temporarily able-bodied, right? None of us is permanently able-bodied, that's for certain. What I like about better strains of identity politics is that it emphasizes agency. It amplifies voice, just as these focus group participants have so explicitly <laughs> stated, articulated their reactions to these sometimes painful portraits of and I think a good identity politics always points out how, the, the, how some of these universal claims are actually quite particular, and they're masquerading as something universal. All rights claims are position, and we have to focus on the way in which, though we have differences, there are different kinds of differences. And we don't have to make that a hierarchy, right? We don't have to say your oppression is worse than mine, mine is worse than yours. But we do have to distinguish between privilege, often unearned, and marginalization that comes from belonging to particular sorts of groups. Those bring different kinds of challenges. And therefore, all of these different sets of cultural groups and identity groups I've mentioned have different, but often complementary, political agendas. And therefore, obviously, they need different representation strategies. So I'll just close with an image I quite like, actually, by a painter and a photographer. Chuck Close, but Chuck Close, like the work of Lynn Weedle and of Sophie and many others,
demonstrate what I think of as the kind of best sort of art practice, which enables the artist, the subject, and the spectator to take control, to direct representation, and to empower. Thanks. <laughs>
blind granny, for example. They too had adopted that attitude. If we're going to be looked at anyway, we may as well get paid for it. And as much as I'd like to take credit for that line, it's actually a quote from Kate O'Reilly's stage play, the aforementioned peeling. Now the premise of peeling being that three disabled women are stuck at the back in the chorus of a postmodern and ironic production of the Trojan Women. The character I played, called Cole, Cole even, waxed lyrical about her body, about being observed because of her body, and yet, at the same time, being, being an observer of the actual observation process. So just to quote a few lines that Cole says, she says, I watch them, the audience, their heads sleek in the dark, with their little quirks, coughs, nervous tics, etc. I watch them and I wonder, what do you think of me? As individuals, particularly perhaps as women, who are constantly subjected to a barrage of images in the media of how we should look and how our body should be, are no different than most people, in that there are bits of me that I like more than others. Last winter, I threw caution to the wind, along with my clothes, and put very nearly all of me on display when I took part in a burlesque performance. I performed with other visibly disabled women at Dada Fest in Liverpool. We almost literally froze all our bits on the display, <laughs> and I did it for free. My choice and within my control. What would it have become, I wonder, if it had been for money? To return to the historical portraits in the exhibition, it seems each individual was selling their uniqueness, their best feature, in fact, being the curves in unusual places. They were regarded as freaks, and we could debate endlessly here tonight whether contemporary disabled people, such as myself, are revered as such today. Are Panolympians, in fact, just super crits. Now as Nick Scarlett, another of the focus group participants, commented, these individuals with impairments perform physical feats to prove their worth in a culture based on survival of the fittest. Were the individuals featured in the original portraits the super crits of their day? Individuals who had, to a certain extent, conformed to that classic cliche of triumph over tragedy, because they had seemingly turned exploitation on its head and were able to gain an amount of respect, earning a living, by exploiting the curiosity of the viewer. Having myself once played a character on stage in a piece who supposedly enshrined fear in a quasi-horror called the Unheimlich Spine, <laughs> I don't actually think that any of the historical individuals were ever really beheld in fear or admiration for looking so different because as humans so easily jaded we long, I think, to see something new. Last year, I was approached by a film company wanting me to audition for The Human Centipede 2. <laughs> yes, a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> the original film apparently being a cult classic. Whatever. Now, I've long held a theory that disabled actors can get ensnared in doing weird and weirdy stuff, just to some non disabled performers end up doing porn. As soon as I mentioned to the makers of said centipede that I would need the audition to be held in a wheelchair accessible space with a loo, etc., I never heard from them again. Recently, I, I had an offer I personally found more flattering when I was approached to play the warrior girl in a short sci-fi film, and paid, of course. I was quite chuffed with that offer, but not flattered enough to, but not flattered enough to do it for nothing. 
not after 12 years of professional acting. It's almost as if, and I'm sure this could almost be said of Victor Stockholm, um, traits, the non-disabled general public want the lift of disabled people's lives and not the reality, which can be quite mundane, like most people's. Last night, saw the final episode in Channel 4 series Seven Dwarfs, which came to tell the real stories of the dwarves. Mm. Real stories about seven dwarves, not an insightful yet humorous documentary about two female actors and five male of short stature, no, just stories about dwarves. The summer of their impairments all lumped together, all living in a house where Snow White comes round for sleepovers. <laughs> Would it have been acceptable for British television, for British television to air a programme entitled Seven Blacks, Seven Gays? <laughs> Again, I wonder. <laughs> I do feel strongly that what's needed is disabled writers to portray disabled characters in TV, literature, etc. Still on TV, disabled characters tend to be standy uppies that sit down and are not very bendy looking. Else, impairment specific storylines are written by said Stanley Uppies. Very rarely do I get put up for telly cartoons because there's no box for me. I'm small, but I have a powered wheelchair, so I can't go into the little person cartoon box. But because I'm teeny tiny, I'm also outside the lines of the average wheelchair user one as well. It feels like the only time someone with a very visible impairment makes a screen debut is when the TV itself morphed into a literal gobble box with programmes like Body Shock. The modern day freak show comes right into your home and I wouldn't put my money on the participants being the ones in control of how they're portrayed. But what if you don't look bendy? As Judy McNamara puts it, also another focus group participant, can you still join the disabled club if you're too symmetrical and be accepted as that by the viewing public? From my experience, there's certainly still a lot that needs to be done. Do you want to talk about this? So, in my experience, have the social and the medical model converged? Have they come close together? Are they likely to ever be able to come close together? I'm thinking specifically with regards to the treatment you've received from health professionals. Have you seen new trainees or new medics come through with a slightly better understanding of, of your experience? Uh, um. So, can I say something? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can ask Sophie if you can say something. Sophie, okay, go ahead, I do, you want some, do you want me to help you out? Yeah, that right. would be very good. <laughs> <laughs> and I might stick my oar in as well. You will, I know you will. Right. Because um, the medical model and the social model can never convert. That's yeah. right. It's the, the totally polarised positions. <clears throat> I think I still, in, from what I understand, is that I still think there's a lot of professional resistance to listening to disabled people and um, believing disabled people and taking on the perspective. And, you know, what's interesting is the perspective of the social model has been... It's not a single thing, it's been around for over 30 years and hundreds and thousands of people um, have contributed to, because it's a model, that's what it is, I mean it's not a single entity or a single body of theory, it is a number of different, but it's what for me, it's where, where, where we have a starting point for that dialogue about, um, or the discourse where you can um, discuss disability in a different way. And I think what's problematic is that, I agree with Toby, you can't convert a social and medical model, but what, what we should be saying is that we want health professionals to be much more engaged with the discourse from our side, because um, that simply doesn't happen sufficiently, and I think there is active resistance to it in an awful lot of cases. Certainly in other work I've been doing recently in mental health, it's very hard to get through um, but, you know, there isn't, and I think one, because one of the things that happens, and the story that Tony told really was a very indicative of that, I think one of the things that's really hard to do is to sort of express that people have, still must maintain dignity, and I know this is an ongoing theme 
within health. But, you know, for many people, the minute they go over into that, that world that is the sort of, you know, the medical world, they stop becoming a person, they become their impairment, and they, their, their dignity is just stripped away. And that's hugely, hugely problematic, you know, which is why I think we need to be very vocal about putting forward our alternative and maintaining that, that, that dialogue must take place. The second part of your question was aimed at Bridget, yeah. and it was, has, if I can sort of paraphrase what you're saying, has this exhibition had any impact on the medical profession? We have had, um, yeah, from the kind of evaluation that we've done, um, we have had some people who have identified as being from the medical profession within the kind of uh, comments that they've left. And generally, I'd say, you know, it's only a handful of people. It's quite difficult because we didn't ask people to say, you know, are you a doctor or not? But um, the ones that chose to say they were from the medical profession, um, I'd say on the whole, there was a very positive response and people saying that they had had ideas challenged and things. Um, there is, we interviewed two disabled doctors, their panels are at the back and uh, Bishra Sharma at the back and Thomas Wells on the right as part of the project. Um, and I have to say that was quite interesting in itself because they were incredibly hard to track down. And I think there's a couple of things going on there that there's probably not actually many disabled doctors out there. And if the, from what I was told, if uh, some people that are disabled within the profession, there is, because of the stigma, which is ridiculous within um, you know, the medical world, they actually might not want to be identified as disabled. But um, Thomas Wells, um, teaches on a course, um, I can't actually remember which school he um, he teaches for, but he does, he teaches young medics about, um, you know, how to relate to um, patients about issues of dignity and self-respect. So I think things are, from what I've kind of picked up from speaking to both of those doctors, things are changing for the better. But I recognise that that's probably a slow, possibly a slow journey, and that not everyone embraces embraces it. But I think, I think now for new medics there is training, more training given and support given on that element than there used to be. I think what I'd say, and you can contradict me because my memory gets a bit hazy, but we tracked down 27 disabled creatives from the present cultural sector really quickly, and. We took a heck of a long time to try and find any disabled doctors. The two that Bridget have mentioned, I think one was not trained in this country, and the second one had his impairment whilst um, as a medical student. So he's already on the road to becoming uh, a doctor and continues to, to, to practice. That's you can make your own connections from that. There's a question at the back. Yeah, my, well, I don't know if it's really a question, but it's about sort of like with modern diagnosis and especially in mental health with all the, the brain scanning stuff that they've now got and the way they're going to come out with a schizophrenic brain and, and kind of is in terms of terminology and how something like this exhibition might actually stop us going back to things like an abnormal brain. Because I think there's a real danger that those things can actually come back into play. Yeah. And kind of where where something like this might take that, really. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense. Really. It does indeed. I mean, what, when you were speaking, it reminded me of a piece of art in the Science Museum by an artist called Yinka Shonabar. And it's about um, Yinka asked pregnant women if he could use their um, scans, uh, fetal scans, mm -hmm. and it, I can't remember, there's three words, it's, some, it's not normal, abnormal, Ben might remember the words, can you remember what they are? Yeah, I knew you were going to Yeah, I'm sorry, I know you looked at your shoes and I thought, he doesn't want me to ask him, he's looking at his shoes, that's why I'll ask him, but it's three, there's three, look it up, because it's a great piece of artwork.
but it does make fantastic reference to, you know, is this fetus normal? And if it's not, do we abort it? And if we do abort it, do we lose people like Yinka Shonabara, who is a unique artist of, you know, of amazing talent? You made a statement, I think, so I don't mm. know whether anybody wants to say anything. Well, I mean, I think it goes back to my concern as well. You know, it was a real joy for me to see those portraits mm. of people that did look dissimilar to myself yeah. Yeah. in those days, because I I just didn't think, think that people survived, mm. or else if they did survive, that they were killed. Yeah. You know, but then I... I We'll go back to the, the previous question about where the exhibition goes because it's like I wonder whether you know in fifty years time all that will be left of me is you know the, the, the picture of this exhibition mm -hmm. because there won't be other people yeah. like with a similar physicality to myself around because they would be because of all the screaming or whatever. The way. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite argument, isn't it? Well. Yeah. yeah. There's a question here. Yeah. Um, and then there's a question here, and then there's a question over here. Okay. Basically, my it, it was a comment really um, about the exhibition. As I was going around it, and this is twice I've been to the exhibition, um, I noticed that it challenged my perceptions of me being a disabled person. Very, very much so because I haven't got a physical disability, but inside I have, I've got a hidden disability. And as I was going around, it it shocked me that there were big, uh, there were people in in that Victorian age who were who were disabled, but they they were showing themselves to be disabled. So the the historical figures were saying, "Here's me. This is what I can do." Um, and I can I can do that, you know, I I use my legs or my arms or my you know, stump or whatever. And and as somebody who's always had a family say, Don't play on your disability, it changed that in a way that it was it sort of eye opening in a way. And the even the even the folk who go to participants they they, they jump out and say uh, you know, by, by seeing what they had said about disability and brought it down to me that, it, you know, I am a disabled person, you know, so, so don't listen to anyone that says, don't play on your disability, don't do this, don't say that, or don't say, you know, or don't, don't, um, don't be anyone else that's got a disability. Because I have one, and I'm not going to listen to it. So you embrace your identity. Yeah. And it's a big, it's a positive thing. Yeah. 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 I think. Well, I'd say, here, here to that. And I'm sure yeah. number of disabled people in the audience would, and certainly people in that focus group would say that. Yeah. Question here. Yeah, you. Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the, uh, the panel. I just, I, got a lot from what, what you've been talking about, um, especially uh, listening to John talking about the history. Um, and it just made me think about how a lot of the shared language or the shared imagery um, is really relevant today. And for example, I mean, I tick loads of boxes, you know. Um, and what I'm interested in, for example, with gay pride, they're dropping the pride bit in terms of the kind of breakaway groups in terms of people not wanting to celebrate gay pride but you know, wanting to, to not have the word and you know, people wanting to use the language. So it's really interesting and I suppose one of my comment is um, I feel like this exhibition in particular could be really beneficial to so-called minority groups, community groups, uh, in order to kind of galvanise some kinds of discussion. I could be interesting to, to hear what I don't know, the women's library had to say about this, or um, um, sort of the black history libraries and things like that, uh, to kind of broaden it out, because I feel like uh, there's a lot of energy within the disability movement that um, and I think one of the ways forward is, is to have a, a bigger conversation 
um, a lot across the board, across all the different kind of groups and, and kinds of <coughs> I can only say that I agree 100%. Yeah. Um, you know, I think a kind of coalitional politics or, mm -hmm. you know, a, a respecting the different forms of distinction, difference making, while simultaneously understanding really how common calls. Mm -hmm. and I'm speaking especially of political calls. Um, I think it's invaluable. Um, I, th I think, you know, these are always going to be imperfect analogies, but we do find tools across these movements as we've seen, you know, we find slogans that empower us, we shall overcome, you know, we find ways of organizing have benefited one group and then move on to benefit others. And indeed what we've learned is that individuals move across these groups. So um, lesbian women feel marginalized from gay organizing that is often very male dominated. They move to feminist organizing but they find that, you know, say the National Organization for Women, mm -hmm. or, you know, we'll speak about something called the Lavender Menace and then they, and then they move on to, to civil rights activism and so on. Women of color have, you know, any number of groups with which they might feel they can become empowered or they feel less so. Um, I just do, I absolutely agree. It's, it's in the best interest of all. Yeah, I wonder if the Equalities Act will, I always think very negatively about the Equalities Act, because mm -hmm. disability gets subsumed by the louder voices, but whether there is you know, the potential for other minority groups to see an exhibition like this and see that commonality and maybe support disabled people, you know, mm. in, in their oppressions. And that's because I'm an optimist. I also think, because we've got a Tory government, then the activism that I took part in as a young person will need to reassert itself. And if it doesn't, then, you know, well, I don't know. If it doesn't, then I'll, I'll be sad because young people need to, um, to, to embrace a collective identity as well uh, and, and become more active against the sort, of, um, the sort of messages that we're hearing from the government that thinks disabled people are scroungers because we um, don't find jobs very easily because we are discriminated against by potential employers. Anyway, I should shut up because there was another question somewhere. And I've lost where it was. Yes, uh, there's two actually. You, you Sorry, and me, please. Yeah, you go first. Yeah. Uh, mine's a further on this, ladies. It's just the idea that I um, have you found any um, of the things international in, in, uh, you know, in different countries of the uh, colleges or positions? Have you got any connections internationally or do you want to take the exhibition? How do you, I mean, I'd love to see it kind of like reaching out to different countries and like you said, yeah, it's scope for a larger thing, it's not just different communities within the UK. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a Royal College of Physicians in Ireland mm -hmm. and Scotland um, and actually I have had a dialogue with um, the one in Ireland about whether it could go on tour to them. Um, and yeah, I'm very open to it going as far afield as, as possible. Um, again, I have had some contact with um, a group in the US who are interested in it. I mean, the issue which it comes down to is um, money, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because it's up to the, um, the borrowing institute to be able to pay for the transportation of the, you know, it's the kind of the practicalities of getting it to another venue. Um, but I'm certainly um, open. What I what I do want to do now is kind of um, yeah publicise it more widely as a touring um, a touring exhibition and see you know and approach people um, kind of proactively about it. So I I'd be really interested in finding that like if you finding if you found in, in like in Europe or in different countries what their documentation, historical documentations were as well, mm. and whether they had any other portraits and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I, don't, I mean, the US obviously does a lot of work around um, disability studies. Um, I have to say that, yeah, I don't have a, a wide knowledge beyond, um, you know, outside of this country. I don't know if you do, John, have a kind of wider 
scope. But yes, it would be very interesting to see how it fits into a more global kind of look at disability history. <coughs> but I actually, I just remembered right now, I was, uh, I, I work in Uganda, and um, one of the things I did just before I left was a fashion shoot, and that was with an albino, completely albino, and that's never kind of been done before um, in Uganda. So it was like really interesting to know that, you know, like what was going to happen when it was be published. Every, like the images are on Facebook now and everything like that. And there's no comments or anything yet. So I don't, I don't know, like it's been, like that's why I'm just really interested in that, in the international scope yeah. for this. There's a whole football team called Albino United. <laughs> and, um, I can't remember where in Africa, but it is an African team. Mm -hmm. There's another question here. Yeah, um, I just wanted to share feedback from Liberty Festival. Briefly, I work for Greenwich and Docklands Festivals, and four weeks ago, we produced um, Liberty London's Disability Arts Festival on behalf of the Mayor of London, and um, there are two great feedback across the board from the audience that we had on the festival. Um, one was it's now a Disability Arts Festival, whereas it started off as a Disability Rights Festival, and dis disabled audiences said we need to focus more on the disability rights. And I think mm -hmm. this is great to hear back. And mm -hmm. it was many we had many voices that mm -hmm. say we need to bring the rights, disability rights element back into the festival. And um, the second was that really stood out that um, Liberty happened for the ninth time this year and it used, used to have Montreux Falga Square all those previous years and it had to be moved for the first time because of the Olympic Games next year and Trafalgar Square being a test site etc. So it, we had to move it over to the South Bend Centre and the National Theatre and the way audience, audiences embraced the new site and said actually what is very positive about the new site that disability arts get a more mainstream exposure because on Trafalgar Square it was quite a contained area and um, whereas at the South Bank Centre and the National Theatre you'd have this really great footfall of people that come to the venue to see art rather than saying they come to see art by disabled artists, but um, that the artists that we work with really enjoyed it, uh, to have that opportunity to display in an arts venue where they will be recognized for the sake of making art. So just wanted to share those because I think it's a really great movement and um, great to hear those voices. Thank I have you. two views on that. Yeah. Um, one view is I went to the Liberty Festival myself I got totally and utterly disorientated where everything was because there was, you had everything in different spaces and uh, a few times I kept getting lost and I couldn't go and watch, I couldn't go and watch everything being happening and um, I was a bit, I was a bit concerned that because there was a market going on um, which wasn't anything to do with liberty. The signage, there wasn't enough signage to say, here's, here's liberty, you know, it's contained here, or whatever. I was a bit... Yeah. I think liberty's taken us down a route yeah, that I don't sorry. want us to go down. Sorry. And we can talk about it yeah. at the end. Yeah. And there's a question at the back, which is going to be the last well, question for tonight, because we're all the time. All right, but it is a bit about liberty. And oh, is it not? Well, then, it's okay. not then I don't want to talk about it because right. it's not part yeah. of our agenda. But you can talk about it over a glass of wine yeah. at the end. Is there any last questions or any last comments from the panel before we wind up? I think it's been a fascinating evening. Yeah. I'm really glad you came. Thank you very much. I want to thank our speakers. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. This is great. Before we go, I also want to thank, thank Shape staff for setting the room out, getting the wine out, and making you all feel welcome, I hope. And so that's Ben, 
and Kirsty. Thank you. The other thing I wanted to do was say thank you to Kirsty in particular because Kirsty is leaving shape very, very soon. So I just wanted to say a particular thank you to her because she's moving on. But shape's a bit like the mafia. And once you've been through shape, you, we never let go. So you will be coming back and you will stay part of the Shape Mafia family. And uh, we expect you to make opportunities for us wherever you go in the future. So thanks again for all you've done for us. Oh, you'll wake up with a horse's head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, there's a chance for a glass of wine. A quick look around the exhibition, um, maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll call it a night. But it's been great to see you all. I hope you have a good dialogue. Thank you. I'll edit this. Yeah.